Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Vinstitute Wine School, an entirely legitimate operation. My name's Moss Schrokogel, and I'm the host of the virtual Vinstitute live stream tasting sessions on behalf of uh, both the Vinstitute Wine School and Oliver Asoyus Wine Country. Like I said, very normal, very intentional. Uh, typically, we do these live streams uh, live, as the name would imply, uh, although that was not a luxury that we were afforded on this particular instance. And typically, we would also do this at the Vinstitute classroom, which is, uh, which is in Oliver, uh, although I I'm in the middle of a move. I'm, uh, I'm moving out to Vancouver Island. Uh, as, as, as my shirt implies, uh, you have to wear these when you're on the island. Um, they just give them to you on the ferry. And, uh, and so I'm in a little bit of a, a transition period, which means that I'm not able to do this live, uh, because I have Vancouver Island internet, um, which is everything that you would expect it to be. And, uh, and I also don't really have much of a recording studio. So hopefully this setting right here will be sufficient for what we want to talk about today. And what we want to talk about today is the softer side of red wines. And we're going to be doing that specifically through the context of one particular red wine, and that is Gamay Noir. This should not be a surprise for anybody who's been following along on our social media, knowing what was coming up here in this uh, in this live stream tasting. But uh, but it could be a surprise to some people who maybe are not familiar with this grape. Gamay Noir is a it is a popular grape in certain areas of the world, but it is uh, almost completely unexplored in others. And right here in British Columbia, we have the privilege of being host to a wine industry that explores many different uh, many different um, styles of grape development, but also many different um, types of grapes that would be grown in different parts of the world. What, what, what I mean to say is that you can look at a three acre wedge of, uh, of, of, um, of Oliver or a Soyuz, and you can find grapes that would be grown in Italy next to grapes that would be grown in Spain next to grapes that would be grown in Germany, and they're all coming through with um, with some degree of, of of quality and distinction, which is really remarkable. We have such a fantastic valley uh, with so many different facets, so many different ways to be. Um, explored and entertained. It means that it, you can have contours and divisions that allow you to grow different types of grapes immediately next to each other, and that is something that allows us to explore a world of different options all within just our backyard. All of this is to say that in a lot of parts of the world you would not be able to find local Gamay Noir. In fact, 75% of the world's Gamay Noir all come from a single province in France. And that province is, uh, if you are familiar with the grape, you'll, you'll recognize the name, it's Beaujolais. Beaujolais is the heart of, of Gamay Noir production. And, uh, and so, like I said, three quarters of the world's Gamay Noir is coming from just that one province. And there's different iterations in different facets within that wine. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at three different Gamay Noir from different producers within Oliver and De Soyuz, And we're going to explore some of the differences in the way that that wine can come across. Because we have, just as a single vineyard can create much uh, differentiation between the different plots that they grow on, you can have different grapes uh, coming through in incredibly different ways, two different vineyards down the road from each other uh, can be absolutely night and day. They, they, they can be basically nations apart within the same, uh, the same tiny little region. So, a uh, little bit of history, a little bit of background about Gamay Noir. I said that we're going to be talking about the softer side of reds, and, uh, and, and that's, well, that's, that's fairly deliberate. This is not accidental. Some people probably would have thought, okay, if you're exploring the softer side of reds, you're probably going to be looking at Pinot Noir, right? 
uh, Pinot Noir certainly is the most recognized delicate red in the global market. And within British Columbia, Pinot Noir is the second most produced red wine grape uh, behind Merlot. Merlot, of course, number one because it's, it's very versatile, very flexible. You can grow it in many different climates. You see it on Vancouver Island. You see it in the Okanagan. You see it in the Shoe Swamp. You see it all around. Uh, Pinot Noir is much more narrow in its restrictions. It has to be grown in specific bands of temperature. It doesn't winter well. It also doesn't do really well in extreme hot uh, temperatures, which means that the Pinot Noir, much more narrow, but still very popular. Still number two on the list of reds. After that, we have Cabernet Sauvignon coming in in third place, Cabernet Franc coming in in fourth, Syrah in fifth, and then down in... The fingers that I'm using are, are completely off. There you go. Uh, number six, in terms of the red wine grapes that we have planted in British Columbia, is Gamay Noir. Some people will probably be surprised by that, thinking that almost in the top five is a grape that maybe they haven't even tried. Maybe they hadn't even heard of before uh, before now, and uh, and again you'd be you'd be permitted uh, that um, that um, absence in your knowledge because even though it's number six in British Columbia, there is not much of it. Just to give you a frame of reference, uh, when you when you work your way down from Merlot, Pinot Noir, Cab Sauve, Cab Franc, Syrah, by the time that you get to Syrah. Uh, you're looking at an annual harvest in British Columbia, an annual harvest of about 1,600 short tons. Okay, that's a, that's that's 1,600 short tons by sort of number five. Then you go to Gamay, which has about 570 short tons. Okay, so that's a massive, massive drop off, going from from uh, 1,600 short tons of Syrah to the next in the list being only 570 short tons. A, uh, a, a year. Back in 2014, uh, the BC Wine Institute did a crop acreage survey and they determined that there was about 170 acres of Gamay Noir planted across British Columbia. 170 acres, I, I mean, maybe maybe that sounds like a lot to you. Um, if you're, a, if you're a, a farmer from the prairies, 170 acres sounds like nothing. Uh, it, and in fact, it really isn't uh, anything at all. <laughs> With, uh, with Merlot, you get into thousands of, uh, of acres that are planted. 172 acres is, uh, is barely even a blip on the map. And yet, when I was talking about how British Columbia has uh, uh, so many different cultures and nationalities of grape varieties all being compressed together, one of the side effects is granularity. We've got more than 70 different grapes being grown in BC, wine grapes, more than 70 different wine grapes being grown in BC. And only the top 10 are actually uh, grown en masse. As soon as you start to get down into the lower numbers, you shrink down until you're seeing 20 acres of these grapes, five acres of these grapes, two acres of these grapes. They all make the list because there's just so many of them. But, uh, but Gamay is kind of the biggest of the little guys in British Columbia, if that makes sense. So, as I said, we are studying the uh, the softer side of red wines, and uh, softness is a really subjective term that I want to just discuss really quickly here. In the uh, in the basic um, structure of wine, when we taste wine, what we're usually what we're usually tasting is a combination of different chemical factors. We have different elements that all interact with each other to give us a basic sensation, to give us flavor, and to give us mouthfeel, right? We in the wine business, we love to talk about texture. We love to talk about mouthfeel. We love to talk about the way that a wine kind of rests upon your tongue. And, uh, and, and the comparison that I give to people is, think about milk. Uh, milk tastes like milk, but everybody has a preference on whether they like skim milk, 1%, 2%, or homogenized. And it all has to do with mouthfeel. It has nothing to do with flavor. It has everything to do with texture. People like tea, people like coffee for the flavor, but they also like it for the texture. And so a lot of the texture in wine is based around three elements. 
sweetness, acidity, and this is the big one, tannin. Technically, you can include alcohol in there because it is an element that does affect and influence the way that uh, that wine tastes. And I'm sorry, I know that the whiteboard is not showing up perfectly right here, but um, bear with me. Uh, sweetness, acidity, and tannin. Those are the three kind of critical components. And the reason that I put them this in sort of this pyramid here is because they all relate to each other. They all interact with each other and they keep each other in balance. When you have a cup of tea, a cup of steeped tea, uh, if you oversteep your tea and you don't add anything to it, it's quite bitter, isn't it? It has this drying effect. It sort of sucks the moisture out of your mouth and it leaves you feeling kind of uh, uh, raspy and dry on the tongue. It's that it sort of prickles that pins and needles. But if you add sugar to your tea, it softens up the impression. If you put lemon in your tea, it softens that impression. Right? There are these different ways to use things like sweetness and acid to balance tannin, because tannin is that dry effect. It is that feeling of dryness. And so when we talk about balancing wines, we look at these three things combined together to create a wine that is palatable. People who are not fond of red wines usually are not fond of tannin. And they can sometimes be talked into drinking a red wine if the tannin is a little bit softer, a little bit gentler. One of the ways to do that is to make a wine that just has very little tannin. Doesn't really need these other factors because the tannin is just reduced. Second way to do it is to still have the tannin, but to boost the levels of these other factors so that the tannin becomes softened, that there's a basically competition for your palate and the tannin gets a little bit driven back. A, a, you know, a, a perfect example of a red wine that a lot of people who don't like red wines can maybe tolerate is, unfortunately, uh, something like Apothic, right? You've got these, these sweet red blends that do have some tannin to them, but they have sweetness to the degree that, uh, that they become, you know, a little more approachable. Apothic is maybe a bad example, um, although... It's also a good example. Uh, a wine that's actually quite nice that uh, that I'll just uh, just throw a bone to is um, is the Incomeep Cellars uh, Talon. Talon is a red blend. Uh, uses a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It has a decent amount of tannin, but it also has some sweetness to it. Right, a level of sweetness that you don't see in any of the other Incomeep wines. They leave a little bit of sweetness in the in the talon, and what that does is it softens the impression of the tannin and it gives it uh, a sort of a softer mouthfeel. Now, when we're talking about Gamay Noir, we have two different things softening the impression. It tends to be lower tannin naturally. You get less tannin in the wine just out of the gates, as opposed to your Merlots, your Cab Sauves, your Cab Franc, your Syrah, your whatnots. But it also tends to have higher acid. So that's like putting a little bit of lemon in your tea. It's going to soften the impression of the tannin by effectively creating competition, if we want to simplify things. So... Are we excited to actually taste the Gamay Noir? Ah, huh? what's that? I didn't hear you. I said, are we excited to taste the Gamay Noir? Ah? Huh? All right. Not only is there nobody here and I'm all by myself inside a tool shed, but this isn't even a live tasting. So uh, I don't really know what I'm doing here. Uh, I'll get on to it. Let's uh, let's just grab the, uh, the, the, the Gamay Noir. Just, uh, just, just one second. The, uh, the, the moment we've all been waiting for. Ah, there it is. Bottle of wine. All right. Number one on our list is the French Door 2019 Gamay Noir. Made by winemaker Pascal Madavon. I draw attention to that. I point out Pascal's name right there because uh, uh, this is Pascal's show. French door right here. This is a uh, this is a brand new winery. So this is actually really exciting to talk about their wines. I uh, I chatted today with the uh, the estate manager of French door, a uh, nice guy named Jake. 
And Jake was telling me about French Door. He was telling me about the uh, the, the priorities of the business and about the belief systems and uh, the philosophies and the way that they do uh, the things that they do. If, uh, if you have not heard yet of French Door, again, you would be forgiven because they are brand new. But, uh, but they are going to be a winery that you're going to want to watch out for because they're doing things that are very, very cool. Something that is very significant to French Door is the fact that they are operating in a extremely low intervention, uh, organic, biodynamic style. They are basically making wines um, in the field. They are growing wines uh, using viticulture and uh, and and you know particular um, um, uh, plots. Of, uh, of their vineyard, uh, specific uh, ways to grow their grapes, uh, harvesting techniques, and whatnot, uh, so that then when they bring it into the winery, they can basically go hands-off. There are a lot of things that get added into a bottle of wine. And, uh, and you know, it's, it, it's, it's just a fact of life. Things like, uh, like um, uh, yeast, things like, uh, like various enzymes to stabilize fermentation. Um, lots, of, lots of little additions go in to just kind of balance a wine and keep it moving. But this is done all wild. That means that everything from French Door, and sorry, I know that the, uh, the label is washed out when I hold it like that. I need to get a little bit closer so that I get the white balance. There you go. Now I look dark and, and, and shadowy. That's fine. Let's give it to the wine. Uh, everything that's done at French Door is wild, which means that once they harvest it, they allow uh, the natural latent yeast in the environment to get in there and start to ferment the grapes. They don't add any yeast. They don't add any stabilizing enzymes to, uh, to um, encourage a specific type of fermentation. Instead, they just allow it to ferment as it is fermenting. And then, as, uh, as Jake was describing with this particular wine right here with this Gamay Noir, they uh, they allow it to macerate on the skins for 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 over seventy days. Uh, they spend months macerating this on the skins, but then they put it into uh, neutral oak barrels. So that's uh, so that's obviously neutral is not new. New oak barrels tend to be the more flavorful oak barrels. Neutral oak barrels have already been used for several years. They have a much softer uh, tone to them, much uh, gentler. And then they do not touch them. Basically, they put them into the, uh, into the oak barrels. Usually what you would do at this time when you're making wine is you would come around with, a, with something like a baton, uh, a stirrer, and you would stir the barrels to kick up the depleted yeast cells and encourage uh, a, a type of um, malolactic fermentation that enhances creaminess. Instead, they do no batonage, they put it into the barrels, they let it sit until it's time to bottle it. And, uh, and so this is, like I said, extremely low intervention winemaking. Uh, this is also all done in a, uh, a very French-inspired style. Like I said, uh, Pascal Madavon, the, uh, the, the winemaker here, he is, uh, is, is uh, behind the wheel of uh, of French Door Winery and uh, and you know the name obviously is uh, is indicating um, what what their intentions are. Uh, Pascal himself he uh, he grew up in in Paris and Burgundy, uh, moved to Bordeaux as a as a young man. He spent more than a decade working in the French wine industry before finally coming to uh, to British Columbia and working on on the very first vintage of a Soyuz La Rose. He's quite a well-known winemaker in the valley. Uh, he uh, he he spent considerable time with the uh, with the Triggs family working on uh, on uh, Calmina, uh, on a Calmina uh, a state winery there, and uh, and he's done a good deal of consulting around the valley as well. So he is in 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 wine circles within British Columbia a a well-known and well-regarded and highly respected name. And, uh, and to have a wine like this that he has put his name on and he has uh, kind of um, taken on as his, uh, his way to express his French culture and French heritage. Uh, in fact, heritage is right there in the name of one of, the, uh, one of their flagship wines. Well, it's, it's exciting. It's, uh, it's, it's very exciting. So this is... Actually, the first uh, first time that I'm 
personally going to try this Gamay Noir. So I'm also excited about that. Nice corks. Natural cork. All right. Ah! It's a class. <laughs> All right. Right away, light color. This is uh, this is really fascinating, especially since, like I said, they uh, they they do a long maceration period with this wine, and uh, and typically long macerations, uh, you know, lead to deeper, richer colors, heavier tannin. But uh, but when you're being as 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 careful and gentle as they're uh, as they're working over at French door, you wind up getting something that is still extremely delicate. Um, I don't know how well you can see the uh, the, the color through there. Uh, it's still extremely delicate, despite <clears throat> the fact that it has had a long time on the skins. So Gamay Noir, you'll notice that I'm using the uh, the, the fish bowl here. Uh, I just found it in the shop, it was convenient. Um, no, actually, it's a, this, this, this was deliberate. Um, the, uh, the, the shape of the glass right here, this is something that is appropriate for tasting things like uh, Chardonnay, your oaked whites, uh, but also your, uh, your, your slightly lighter, more delicate reds. Think of it like this. You start with a narrow glass uh, when you have your clean, crisp whites, and then you move towards your broader glass into your heaviest whites. And then you jump the fence into red wines and you start at the lightest red wines with the same glass. And then you taper down into sort of a taller glass as you, uh, as you move on to the, uh, the, the heavier Bordeaux style reds. So there's a part where they almost meet in the middle where the, uh, where the heaviest whites and the lightest reds all use basically the same glass. And the reason that you use the fish bowl like this is because it gives a huge amount of surface area. Look at that. Right there, there, there's there's an enormous amount. It's 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 this the size of my head. Look, I'm inside the glass right now. That's <laughs> trick of perspective. I learned that from Peter Jackson. Uh, so this right here is uh, a, a wine glass that's going to allow you to have a large amount of surface area, which uh, really encourages oxidization. It allows the wine to breathe, and as well, you have this huge open uh, mouth of the glass, which is going to, it's going to sort of, um, allow the, uh, the natural aromatics of the wine to, uh, kind of expand out. You, you either contract or you release and expand the aromatics depending on the, the size of the mouth. And so with these right here, you want them to waft out, you want them to breathe, you want just lots and lots of air. That's exactly what I'm giving this right now. Gamay Noir tends to be fairly floral. It's a it's a, it's a lovely it's a lovely wine in terms of uh, in terms of combining elements of uh, floral aromatic floral tones with earthiness and with uh, with sort of um, juicy red fruit. Sometimes you get a little bit of a, a little bit of tartness because, like I said, the acid tends to be a little higher in the Gamay. So you can get these uh, these sort of sour cherry raspberry tones, but uh, what I'm getting right away immediately is uh, is actually earthiness. I'm getting this uh, this this sort of um, hmm, sort of a, almost a graphite potting soil. I know those are two different things. Hmm. There's not much of this wine to go around. I just uh, I should point that out. French door again, brand new, and uh, and uh, their tasting bar is open. Uh, it's by appointment only. They do seated tastings, so uh, so you want to make sure that you call ahead if you happen to be in the Oliver area, and if you want to order their wine, you can uh, you can you can get it online. But uh, but because they're a new winery, uh, it's it's not broadly distributed yet. So it's not something that you can necessarily pop into your local uh, liquor store. Uh, or a grocery store to pick up, you're uh, you're gonna need to basically get it from the source, and I really encourage it. They're they're only producing a few thousand cases of wine right now, and uh, holy smokes, <laughs> it smells so good. <laughs> and it's it's really worth um, checking out. 
there's always something exciting about brand new wineries, but uh, but I, I, I will say this: I don't I don't I don't want to um, I don't want to bring anything down. But sometimes the first year of a winery can be a rocky one. It can be a rough one, uh, especially if if they haven't had enough time to really uh, allow their wines to come into their own. If they're if they're bam kind of firing out of the gates with a with, with a couple of you know young products that haven't really had enough time to uh, to uh, you know appreciate with age but uh, uh, from what i have seen and from what i have heard um of french door everything that they're coming out with right now is uh top of game they uh they're they're not uh, they're not racing they uh they they took their time and they're bringing out things that are worthy of tasting all right i am going to i am going to try this now Oh boy, but 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 again, on the nose, I'm getting more floral tones right now. I said I was going to taste it. I'm not. I'm just going to smell it because smelling is so good. Smelling is so much fun. It smells like fruit. I'm getting I'm getting getting dark cherry. No, red cherry. I'm getting cherry tones. I'm getting more of this earthiness. I'm still getting this uh, this this sort of um, potting soil peat moss. And I'm getting a little bit of a, almost like violet. There's a, there's, there's a, almost a little bit of dried flower. There's a, there's, there's a little hint. It's not potpourri, you know, it's not, uh, it's not a, it's not kind of an, an insipid, overly uh, uh, aromatic floralness. It's not perfume. It's, 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 it's a tasteful, light, dry flower. Okay, I'm going to give it a sip. Remember that when you're trying wine, you always want to take a sip, allow that first sip to move around in your mouth, kind of pass it all around, give it a minute, do the primer coat, then you can swallow it or spit it out. And uh, and you just use that first taste to get ready. The second taste is where you really start to get the flavor. So primer coat. <laughs> oh man that's so good that's really really good um fantastic balance right out of the gates it came in soft and warm on the palate it had this very pleasant roundness and then a little hint of tartness comes in in that kind of again sour cherry is actually a pretty good descriptor it's got that little bit of sour cherry flavor there and then on the back palate, there's a there's there's a little bit of a um, little bit of grip, you know, a little little tiny bit of of um, of bitterness. Uh, Jake today on the phone he was describing the fact that when they harvest this gamay, uh, they 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 pick it quite early to maintain high acidity. They crop it really low. They only take three tons per acre. Uh, an average acre of grapevines could produce up to ten tons of fruit. They only take three tons of fruit. They they prune, 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 prune down to one third capacity so that they wind up getting, you know, more concentrated grapes. You're not spreading out your attention. And so they pick it a little bit early for high acid and they bring it in in two different um, segments. One of them, they ferment whole cluster. Uh, and um, and then one of them, they have a little bit of stem. They have 15% stems. Uh, uh, in with the grape. So, so the point is, it's had a little bit of stem contact, which can, uh, which can, it can, uh, it can have some impact on the pH levels, on the acid levels, uh, from a from a chemistry level. It can also lend just a tiny hint of of, of bitterness. And uh, bitterness tends to be a negative term for people, but it shouldn't be because bitterness is a really fundamental flavor, and it's something that tastes good. If you like almonds, you like bitterness. If you like coffee, you like bitterness, right? Uh, we don't want a, a, an over uh, abundance of bitterness, but a little bit like this uh, it does great work for texture on the palate. Oh man, this is a really nice wine. <laughs> this is a really, really beautiful wine. Um, it's only 12.3% alcohol. That's something else that's really interesting. It's a, it's very low alcohol and that's something that you get when you harvest early. If you, if you wait and you, and you, um, allow your fruit to ripen, 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 
uh, then you get more sugar developing. And that sugar either has to turn into a sweet wine or it needs to be burned off into alcohol. And so in this case, when they harvest it a little bit early, they maintain a nice high acid. They avoid the, the pitfall of, of having too much sugar. And this is very low residual sugar. This, this, is, this is less than half a gram of, uh, of residual sugar. And, uh, and you also wind up getting low alcohol which in this case allows the wine to be a little bit cleaner, a little bit lighter. Alcohol is viscous, it's thick, it enhances the, uh, the, the, the texture in the body of a wine. And so this is clean, this is light, this is delicate because of that low alcohol. And, and it's also, it, it's, not, it's not hot, it's not aggressive, right? It doesn't have the, um, the, the kind of um, in-your-face oomph that uh, that higher alcohol wines have this is this is so easy to drink um you know you can you can forget that that it's alcoholic at all um this is, this is bad i guess but um fun definitely enjoyable all right french door uh french door um like i said brand new winery wines available uh online and uh, and this is their 2019 Gamay Noir. Uh, oh, it comes in at uh, at twenty twenty eight dollars. Um, so that's a, so that's a great price for a wine like this. And uh, let me actually pop that up on the uh, on the old board here. Give you a little bit of information. The uh, the next wine that we're going to try after this, just to uh, just to get you ready while I'm putting this information up, is the. Vin Amité Gamay Noir. This is their 2018. The Vin Amité 2018 Gamay Noir. Just put that down there. French door! That was their 2019, and it comes in at 20 eight dollars great price for the wine and again just really fantastic wine great wine making great place worth a check out next Vinemite. if you haven't visited Vinemite, then it, you know what and i say this just about every live stream so so forgive me for repeating myself but if you haven't visited Vinemite in person you are doing a disservice to yourself because they are some of the most pleasant and charming people and really the the i would say some of the exemplars of the the family winery in uh, in the south okanagan um they're in some good company there there's lots of excellent family wineries in the south okanagan but this is the uh, this is the the sort of combined effort of uh, of ray and wendy Kalom. Uh, I'm bad at saying their last names, so I hope they forgive me. And uh, and their two daughters, uh, uh, in, in particular Catherine, who has uh, kind of stepped in as as winemaker and general operations manager. Uh, the Kalam family, they together all operate this uh, this vineyard and winery. They uh, sorry, I'm still drinking the French door. <laughs> mm. Just pour that into my coffee cup. Vinemite was uh, was started. Uh, it was about uh, I think it was about eleven years ago that uh, that Ray and Wendy bought the, uh, the the vineyard that they started the vineyard that uh, that they're on. They are easy to see if you're driving through the South Okanagan uh, because you're, you're you're heading up the highway between Asoyus and Oliver, and uh, and just after you pass sort of Road Eight, Road Nine. Uh, you'll see them just on the right-hand side. They're, they're, they're the only winery that's kind of on the right-hand side after that point when you're getting that close to Oliver. Uh, they usually have their sandwich boards out, uh, big Salmon Safe logo, boom, slapped on the side of the building, uh, letting you know that, uh, that they, they farm in uh, sort of um, environmentally friendly uh, fashion. 
and they have this cute little tasting bar that is uh, that is almost exactly like uh, what it would look like if you walked into um, into somebody's kitchen, uh, and that's and that's meant to be a compliment. It's very homey. It's very cozy. It's very inviting. And uh, they've also been very well known, uh, if you have gone touring around the South Okanagan, you've probably heard that they are very well known for, for having absolutely fantastic charcuterie platters. They make excellent wine, they are friendly and welcoming, and they have excellent little plates of food that you can get. You can sit out on their patio and look out over the vineyard and have a drink of wine and eat these charcuterie platters. Unfortunately, right now during COVID-19, you know, it's it, it's not sustainable, but uh, but good news is that uh, is that they will very soon have these charcuterie um, uh, packages available for people to take with them. So if you've been a fan of the Vinamite charcuterie uh, in the past, you can get it again in the future here. You'll get it as a little uh, as a little uh, package that you can take with you and you can buy a bottle of their wine and you can go and you can do yourself a little uh, a little picnic lunch with it. Um, which I, I'm sure is going to become extremely popular uh, as soon as they release that, which, uh, which uh, again, I was told very shortly. So the Gamay Noir, this is, uh, this, this is one of the wines that, uh, that Venemite would be known for. They do, they do a number of, of magnificent wines. Uh, I personally, I'm a huge fan of their Chardonnay. I think they do a really stellar job with it. And they make three different... Um, uh, Bordeaux blends using different combinations of Merlot, Cab Franc, Cab Sauve, some of them Petit Verdot, uh, Malbec, I believe, is uh, is in them too, um, in in different combinations. And there's the three of them there, and uh, uh, all of them really distinct, really interesting. So you can check out the different ways that a Bordeaux blend can uh, can can come together by using different combinations of grapes. You can do a little kind of mini Vinstitute class there just by tasting those three wines and uh, and learning the differences. But um, but the Gamay Noir is uh, is probably one of the wines that they are best known for and uh, and and I bring up the charcuterie partially because this is a, a really phenomenal food pairing wine. Gamay Noir is always known as a really pardon me, a really excellent food pairing wine. Um, in fact, one of the things that you'll always read, if you're looking up Gamay Noir, it'll say, shockingly good with food, and uh, and it'll always highlight the fact that it's even good with fish. Believe it or not, even with fish. Fish is, is a bit of a sticky wicket in the wine community because it can be a really tough one to pair with. Uh, tannic wines just do not really mesh with it, but, but the Gamay Noir with... And I've erased that now, so, so just, just remember that at one point the word acid was there. Gamay Noir having a little bit more acid can go well together with fish. Uh, it can also go well together with tomatoes, which is another thing that, you know, doesn't always work well with, uh, with wines. Um, Gamay Noir with, uh, with the relatively low tannin and the slightly higher acid goes well with tomato-based dishes, and it goes well with fish. Uh, and it goes really well with charcuterie. Which is why, uh, which is why this is probably one of the favorites at Vin uh, I think for a lot of people, it, it, it had become a habit to uh, to get uh, Gamay Noir in a charcuterie plate. I've chatted with people who live in the South Okanagan who say that every week after work on Friday, they just pop over to Vin they get some wine, they get a charcuterie plate, and they just hang out. Right? They're not going there you know, as consumers to just buy a bottle of wine. They're, they're going to just enjoy themselves. And so that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's a pretty high recommendation. So this wine right here, the reason that I placed this after the French door is because it's a little more heft to it. There's just a little bit more oomph. And this is going to start to show off some of the differences that we get in Gamay Noir. Gamay has the ability to be, sorry, I'm positioning the bottle up here so that I can see the alcohol level. I guess I could just show it to everybody. I, why do I need to why do I need to be shy? Uh, it's a, it's still relatively light. It's a 13%. There you go. Uh, it's 13% alcohol. Um, but what was I saying? Uh, Gamay Noir uh, it can certainly fall into uh, a number of different categories. It can be extremely light, like that French door, or it can be uh, a little heavier, a little more fruit forward. Uh, have a little bit more juiciness to it, and 
and this right here we're starting to edge a little bit to a little more rich a little more full mm. so on the nose we're actually getting some uh, a little bit of um, uh, toastiness a little bit of smokiness so I know that uh, I know that Catherine uh, in the winemaking used a little bit of new oak for this one right here. This is the 2018 Gamay Noir and uh, and in the past they typically just use neutral oak in the same way that French Door uses neutral oak but uh, but they were saying that in, in the 2018 vintage um, they just felt like a little bit of extra pop was a, was a nice compliment to the wine and sure enough you, you, you smell this this slight sort of um, almost this this sort of caramelized toastiness there on the nose still getting some of the earthiness although although less earthy than the french door a lot of fruit mm, and that gentle sort of a sort of uh, enticing um uh, hint of almost sort of this creme brulee you know, there's that little kind of uh, uh, toffee sweetness there on the nose. Mmm. A taste. Mmm. Mmm. This is nice. This is really nice. We told uh, we told Catherine that we were going to be using this as one of the tasting bottles, and that we needed one bottle uh, for for these purposes. She gave me two. That's a mensch right there. <laughs> that's that, that's that's good people. Two bottles, not just one. Hmm. So this uh, right here on the palate, this is fantastic because this is showing off again some of these differences because I'm getting a little bit of acid, but. I'm detecting the acid less than in the first one because the tannin's a little bit up on this. I'm getting a little bit more tannin. There was just a little bit more extraction, you know, a little bit more steeping. If you think about the, the maceration process as a process in which you're drawing out tannin, you're drawing out color, you're drawing out flavor from the skins into the juice, this has been steeped a little bit longer with that. And so, or not longer, because like I said, the French door was a very long maceration, but it's been steeped more, more, um, uh, I don't want to say aggressively, but it has been, uh, more has been drawn out of the skins. I am getting more tannin, but it's not just the skins, it's also the oak. Remember that I said that they used a little bit of new French oak? Uh, some of the tannin in wine is going to come from the skins, and some of it is going to come from barrels. And if you have a very light wine coming in, you can you can bulk it up by using barrels. That's not necessarily what they're trying to do here because this is still a light wine. But that use of the oak has given it a little bit of extra texture that it would not have had otherwise. That's that's you know that's the winemaking at play right there. Mm. It's good. This is um, this is a wine that uh, would be very good chilled, as well. Not every not every red wine chills well. I know we've talked about this in previous live streams. I've talked about Pinot Noir. I've talked about uh, Dolcetto, um, which was an unoaked red. Uh, when we talked about oak and Chardonnays and whatnot, and this right here, this is another example of a red wine that would chill very well because it isn't so aggressive with its tannin that the uh, that the coolness is going to uh, set that off and make it aggressive. Uh, if you chill this, it, it just tastes fresh. It tastes bright. This this is a wine that I have had chilled on many occasions, and uh, and I'll tell you, it works. It's it's a, it's a good call. Hmm. So, in terms of the Vin Amite experience, going to visit them, uh, I mentioned before with French Door, you want to call ahead for appointments. Vin Amite, same situation. Uh, you want to call ahead for appointments right now. They're doing 30-minute uh, long seated tastings where you try through the wine. And one of the neat things about the Vin Amite experience right now is that, uh, is that they, they give you a glass that has Vin Amite stenciled right on it. And, uh, and as part of the tasting fee, you get to keep the glass. 
this is a this is something that you know all wineries right now are trying to figure out how to deal with COVID-19, how to deal with uh, with with uh, um, the restrictions of having people come in and general hygiene. And every winery has adapted in different ways. Um, some wineries have have implemented, you know, um, extreme uh, sanitation procedures surrounding the fact that your employees have to reach out and take glasses from the customers that the customers have been drinking from they need to put those into the dishwashers what do you do with that do you put on you know a, a new pair of of disposable gloves every time that you know you're taking the glasses and then and then take them off afterwards um, everybody's doing it in a different way um and the way that uh, that vinamite is doing it is the idea that you come in you get your glass it has vinamite stenciled right on there it's a nice glass you get your wine and then when you're done, you just take the glass with you. No, uh, no, no dishes, no sanitation issues in terms of the, uh, the the exposure and the contact between the guest and the host. So, uh, so it, it's it, it's an interesting and kind of neat way of doing things. And it means that if you want to go visit Vinamite right now, you get a fantastic half hour long seated tasting, private, and you wind up walking away with a a a monogrammed glass, which is a uh, which is kind of a cool touch. They did that in Scotland when I went to the Scotch whiskey experience in Edinburgh. You get to take your little whiskey glass away afterwards, which was just so exciting. Ah, this is a this is a fun session. I'm really glad that we're doing Gamay Noir because it's it's such a delightful wine. I like Pinot Noir, but uh, but mm, don't uh, don't don't hate me if I say that I like Gamay Noir. I think a little bit more. I think that that it tends to be a little more lively. I love that uh, that that. Um, that acid, the brightness that it lends to these wines, and as I'm tasting this wine, I'm getting more and more of that of that sour cherry uh, coming in. But it still has that toastiness, which is one of the reasons why this would be really good with the charcuterie. You take cured meats, right, and uh, and you get that kind of smoky flavor coming in together with it. I mean, that's just that's a a fantastic combination, complementary flavors. Vin. Amite, that's their 2018, and this one comes in, I believe, $30. Let me just check my notes. There we go, $30. This is after tax, by the way. This is this is tax included. Uh, there's no additional costs on top of that. So, again, right around that same level as French Door. Fantastic price for a fantastic wine. Vin Amite, Gamay Noir. Mmm, mmm. Ah, it's really good. Okay. Well, I've got one left. And today it is... I never know where to put that. I feel like, I feel like, you know, did anybody watch the, uh, the, um, the SpaceX, the Dragon, uh, 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 rocket crew module go up? Uh, up to the International Space Station. You know, the astronauts are sitting there and they're in this tiny little uh, kind of two foot by three foot space. And, uh, and you know, they, they, they fire up and then they go dark for the night. And then the next morning, they kind of check back in and they're in their PJs and they're in this teeny tiny little area and they've just kind of unrolled their sleeping bags and they've slept in there. And you think to yourself like, wow, how do you, how do you, how do you survive in an area like that? Well, I'm experiencing it right now. I'm exactly like an astronaut right now. There's genuinely no difference. The third and final wine that I'm going to taste with you tonight is the... Oh, that's a, that's, that's good contrast there. Uh, is the Desert Hills. The Desert Hills Estate Winery 2018 Gamay Noir. You'll notice that they all just say the name of the, the grape. Nobody has a funny name for this. Nobody's calling it like, oh, synchronicity. You know, they're just calling it Gamay Noir. And, uh, and, and that's because typically you name your wine after the grape. Sometimes if you have um, different iterations of the same grape, you will give it a special name to differentiate it. If you do a blend, you'll give it uh, a distinct name to, uh, to to kind of give it its own moniker. But uh, but particularly when you're working with something that's a little bit unusual, that's a, that that's not a grape that people are coming across every day, um, you want to just call it what it is. You want to just have the straight name right there, 2018 Gamay Noir, and that's what you have. 
I've uh, I have talked with uh, with 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 a winemaker in the industry who said that he worked with Gamay Noir and people thought that they were doing a funny take on Pinot Noir and people would say, "Oh, I'll try the, I'll try the Pinot Noir." And uh, and he would say, "No, no, that's a, that that's Gamay Noir." And they'd say, "Oh, I thought that was just your name for it. I thought you were being Gamay. Gamay, that's just a fun thing you're doing, right?" I said, "No. No, it's not." So, 2018 Gamay Noir from Desert Hills. Talking about family wineries, this is another one of these 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 excellent examples of what you get in the South Okanagan. This is uh, a winery that was founded by basically three brothers. Uh, started up back in 2003, so it's been a, it's been around for for nearly 20 years now. Um, it is one of the best known and best respected wineries on the Black Sage Bench, uh, over on the east side of that route between Oliver and De Soyuz, uh, an area known for fantastic heat, for very sandy soils. Um, by the way, I, I failed to mention before, French Door is also uh, kind of on the Black Sage Bench, but it's in the sort of northeast quadrant of it. You're getting up closer to uh, to the Oliver area, and uh, and they have more gravelly soil up where they are. There's a there's a bit of a gravel bar that runs through the Black Sage Bench. Uh, Desert Hills, though, this is this is down in the prime sandy area, and they do some fantastic red wines uh, because of the the heat that they get down there. But it was uh, these three brothers, Randy, Jesse, and Dave, uh, tour, and uh, and they 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 started up this winery in 2003. Uh, Randy's son, uh, Rajan, uh, is is the assistant winemaker. He uh, he works with the head winemaker, Anthony, and uh, and um, Rajan also has his own brand, uh, Ursa Major, where he's doing some really really neat wines as well. So Desert Hills is uh, you know again one of those grand family operations where. Everybody is involved. Everybody has uh, their own role, and uh, and everybody's kind of contributing. It's a, it's really fun to see, and uh, and you know the the quality speaks for itself. The uh, the 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 degree of um, of quality in terms of farming and winemaking are. Uh, are things that have made Desert Hills a favorite of people visiting the valley or living in the valley for, uh, well, again, almost 20 years. So, this right here, this 2018 Gamay Noir is, unfortunately, uh, a pretty rare beast to find. I, uh, I got my hands on this wine before I came out here to Vancouver Island um, so that I could do it for this tasting, but since the time that I picked up this bottle, it has flown off the shelves so fast that, to be perfectly honest, you might not be able to find the 2018 anymore. Uh, the 2019 is is coming, but I've noticed that it's not actually listed on the website right now, uh, so, uh, so we may just be in the tiny gap in between 2018 and 2019. So if you are looking for this wine right now and you're not able to get it, or or if you were looking over the last couple days and you weren't able to get it, uh, just be patient. The 2019 is on its way, um, and uh, and it will be worth the wait. This is a uh, this is a wine that brings people out in the winter. I say that because I, 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 I've known people in the South Okanagan. I, uh, I, I worked with a woman who said that, uh, that every winter after all the wineries close, uh, she still goes up to Desert Hills uh, twice a month to buy a case of Gamay Noir. And they, uh, they, you know, they clear away the snow, they open the doors just to sell her a case of Gamay Noir, close the doors back up. So it's, uh, so it's something that keeps people coming back specifically for this wine. And uh, and one thing that uh, that is really uh, amazing, considering the rarity of Gamay Noir, and uh, and the fact that um, you know they tend to be wines of, of of high quality, this is relatively inexpensive at a, uh, a tiny little twenty three dollars. I'm going to put twenty eighteen slash twenty nineteen. Because again, it might not be realistic for people to get their hands on the 2018. Desert Hills. Do you like how I did French door in capitals and then the rest of them all in lowercase? It was the Vinamite because they have upper and lowercase built into their name. The A is uppercase, the V is not. So you can blame them. You can blame the Kaloms for the fact that now my grammar is just is just a mess back there. Capitalization is not grammar. 
I know, I'm sorry. I was an English teacher once. So this is the darkest of the bunch. Uh, and I know you can't really see it, but uh, it has the deepest purple. It has the richest hue. And, uh, and it has the most opacity. Opacity, fun word, it just means how hard it is to see through something. So this is a little bit more opaque. The other wines were a little more translucent. They were a little bit lighter, a little easier to see through. This is darker, this is deeper looking, this is richer. And right away on the nose there is this concentration of fruit. Now, this is interesting because the uh, the winemaker, Anthony Buchanan, uh, uh, he has actually said that in previous years, or sorry, in more recent years, in these recent years like 2018 and 2019, uh, he's actually trying to step away from uh, uh, the level of extraction that you can sometimes get in these, in these, you know, big, beefy, hot climate Black Sage Bench wines. He's been trying to make this Gamay Noir a little bit lighter, a little bit more delicate, because given where they are and where they're growing their grapes, they can get some really extracted flavors. They can get higher levels of alcohol. They can get big, intense, juicy fruit bombs. And he's been wanting to make this in a slightly more delicate, slightly more French style. And so this is actually, this is a, a really interesting progression within the Desert Hills line. This is a wine that is lighter than the Gamay's have been in the past, uh, but still I would say is definitively a Desert Hills Gamay. So for the fans of Desert Hills Gamay who have had it in the past but haven't tried the 2018 or the 2019, um, is still really worth uh, uh, looking at because you haven't lost any of the things that you love, um, but it's just a little tiny bit more refined now. Mm. This, this, this warmth, this concentration, this density on the nose, even though this is lighter, right, in comparison with the previous two that we've just tried, you're getting this, uh, this, this juiciness of fruit immediately popping forward. Mm. <laughs> oh my goodness it's so good <laughs> it's just like it is really just like taking a bite of 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 a cherry of just an enormous plump juicy cherry it is just cherry juice there is this beautiful balance between the sweetness and the acid there is tannin the tannin is not overwhelming uh, there's a little hint of that acid. There's a little bit of sweetness that is not not over extreme at all. Uh, again, really well balanced. The fruit is so juicy. It's so ripe. It's so plush. I mean, this is just this is. It's so easy to see why residents in a Soyuz are going up and buying cases of this every month, all year round. Mm. because this would just be the wine that you just drink you just yeah it's it is, is not it's not something that you're that you're waiting for for a friend to come over you're not waiting for a specific dinner to pair it with you're just drinking it you're just opening it and you're drinking it because it tastes good the alcohol is a little bit higher on this one this is uh this is 13.7 so we've gone, I'll remind you, from uh, from about 12.3 with the French door to about 13 odd uh, with the, um, was it 13 on the dot? Yeah, 13 on the dot with uh, with Vinamite, up to 13.7 with the Desert Hills. So we're moving along. Actually, we're moving 0.7% uh, uh, each time. That's, uh, that's, that's perfect. Um, but, uh, you know, none of these are hitting high alcohol. None of these are, none of these are hitting that. 14 14.5 that's that's where you start to border onto your high alcohol levels where you can start to feel it where you start to taste it where it starts to impact the uh the the overall presence of the wine so all of these would be considered light alcohol but there's gradients within light now um I i'm i'm getting close to the end of the stream right here and i cannot talk about gamay without mentioning Beaujolais Nouveau. I, uh, I I talked about Beaujolais being the province 
in um, France, where you have um, almost all of the world's gamay noir supply, 75% of it. But, um, but there's a very specific thing uh, that happens in Beaujolais, and, uh, and some people will have heard the term Beaujolais Nouveau without even really recognizing that Beaujolais is, is a region. They just know the term Beaujolais Nouveau. And Beaujolais Nouveau is um, this incredibly fresh run of gamay noir. What they do in Beaujolais is they they make several different uh, gradients and calibers of of Gamay Noir, and one of them is this fast press quick wine where they harvest it, they make it as swiftly as you can make a red wine, no time uh, settling down in oak. They basically just turn it around, they macerate it with the skins, they ferment off the sugar into alcohol, and then boom, they bottle it. And uh, and you're 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 drinking it by uh, by the end of the year, so you harvest it, and a couple months later you have it. I think it is the third weekend in November. Don't hold me to that, uh, but uh, but I'm pretty sure it's about the third weekend in November. Um, that is when it's traditionally released. It is illegal to release the Beaujolais before that. There's a festival. There's a there's a whole event. If you ever happen to be in France in the winter, um, this is a very exciting thing to uh, to catch. And uh, and Beaujolais Nouveau is not designed to be a long-lasting wine. It's not one of those red wines that you set down for years. In fact, some people would say, and in my experience tasting, that if you try it by Easter the next year, it's not very good anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, you've you, you've kind of lost it. So it's designed to be, you know, you drink it within the first half a year that uh, that you have it. And, uh, and... And you wind up getting something that is bright, clean, fresh, very fruit forward, not long lasting at all because it hasn't had any time to develop tannin or, or really kind of settle in, lock in its position. Um, but you wind up getting a preview of the season. And, uh, and, and what I've heard some people say is that you taste the Beaujolais Nouveau to understand what that year was like. And so if you try the Beaujolais Nouveau from 2019 and you like it, then a few years later you come back and you buy the 2019 Gamay Noir that is produced with with you know more typical uh, conditions and uh, and is designed for a little bit more age right and uh, and so the Beaujolais Nouveau informs you about what that year is going to be like very neat idea very cool and so when I see things like the like the French Door 2019 some people might look at that and say whoa that's pretty quick <laughs> hold on there. Right? How are you making a 2019 red wine already? Don't red wines take two years to make? Don't you have to put it into oak barrels for 12 months at least? Uh, and the answer is no, you don't. Uh, you know, we'll be trying the Desert Hills 2019, and we've got the French Door 2019, and we've got them at our step right now, and it's because Gamay Noir is a wine that you can turn over fast and get something bright, get something lively, get something really, really exciting that uh, that doesn't necessarily compromise its integrity by being made fast. Mm. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, I'm going to... I'm just going to shut off the lights in my in my workshop here and I'm just going to drink this in the dark by myself. Um, uh, well, we don't really need to talk about that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, to wrap up the stream right here. I want to thank everybody for uh, for for coming out for uh, for for um, watching. I know that this was a slightly unconventional format, but hopefully it worked for everybody. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully my strange lighting and odd background and orange extension cord have not uh, have not uh, put anybody off. I promise that by the next live stream, two weeks from now, where we are going to be examining aromatic white wines, aha, uh -huh, that's going to be fun. I promise by that time I will have uh, something different figured out to it uh, to do here. This was a uh, this was a uh, an interim solution, and I hope it worked out nicely. I want to remind everybody that all three of these wines that we tried here today are available to purchase from the wineries. You can you can contact French Door, you can contact Vinamite, and you can contact Desert Hills. 
to gain access to all of these wines. Uh, shipping is available uh, pretty much wherever you are. And, uh, and as well, uh, if you want to learn anything more about the wines of the South Okanagan, obviously the place to do it is oliverasoyus.com. That is the, uh, the, the main website for Oliver Asoyus Wine Country. Uh, vinstitute.com uh, is, is me. Um, there's not really anything going on there because I don't have a home, and therefore I can't really teach classes in person. So really, I'm just doing this, which means if you want to support either Oliver Asoyas or the Institute, then uh, just tune in and watch these. We do these every second week. And like I said, the next one, two weeks from now, is going to be on the topic of aromatic whites, which is something that I get very, very excited about. You can also listen to the podcast that I've been producing. It's called Uncork the Sun with the Institute Wine School. It's done again in conjunction with Oliver Asoyas Wine Country. And I release that also every second week on opposing weeks of these. So I just released one um, uh, back on Friday of last week where I recorded the info from the back of my car because, once again, I don't have an actual home uh, or a real office. So that's fun. I'm doing a, a series of interviews with winemakers from the Okanagan. And, uh, and so you can hear some really cool people talking about being in the wine industry. That's all at the, uh, the podcast, which you can find on oliversoyuse.com, the website, or vinstitute.com, or you can find it just, uh, just through Stitcher, through Spotify, through Apple Podcasts, any podcast medium you have. Just look for Uncork the Sun um, with the Institute Wine School. Uncork the Sun. All right, everybody. Uh, before I go, I, I guess I, I have to... I have to make my way over to my computer to shut off this stream. So I guess you're going to come with me. I'm just going to set this here. And so, uh, okay, all right. What have we got here? We've got tools. We've got, there's, there's my key light uh, up there. All right. We've got ah, my podcast mic. We've got my notes taped to the side of a wardrobe. There's the wines. This is where I've been doing my office work next to a bunch of 1938 radios that are being restored. Ah! And here's a little bit of internet regression for you uh, just before we go. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I appreciate your patience and your tolerance. Let us uncork the sun together. I didn't bring my glass, so I'm going to hold up this vase of flowers that my two-year-old daughter bought for me so that it wouldn't smell so bad in here. Uh, chin chin. Clink. Bye-bye, everybody.